the Bush administration has tried today to apply pressure on those it regards as most responsible for the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The Secretary of State, Lawrence Eagleburger, has made public a list of people who the U.S. believes are to blame for some of the war crimes committed there. They are mostly, but not all, Serbians. And the U.S. is threatening war crimes trials. Here's ABC's Barry Dunsmore. The U.S. decided that naming some names of those responsible for war crimes would at least show the world was not indifferent. In a closed session of the International Conference on Yugoslavia in Geneva, Secretary Eagleburger listed some of the crimes and some of those the U.S. believes are responsible for them. Among them, the siege of Sarajevo, where thousands of innocent civilians have been killed. The murders and torture of thousands of people in detention camps such as Omarska. Drago Perchak was the commander of that camp. The murders of two to three thousand Muslim men, women and children at a brick factory in Birchko. Zeliko Reznjatovic, who goes by the name Arkan, leads the militia linked to this atrocity. The biggest names named by Eagleburger were the president of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic, the political leader of the Bosnian Serbs, Radovan Karadic, and their commander, General Miladic. Eagleburger did not specifically call them war criminals, but he said the U.S. holds them politically responsible for the crimes against humanity. Uh, it was going to be the responsibility of Mr. Milosevic, Mr. Karadzic, and General Mladic at some point to explain to the rest of the world whether they exercised specific authority over their underlings to prevent them from doing the sorts of things that they did. And on the basis of what we know at this time, I'd have to say they're going to have a hard case to make. Secretary Eagleburger is now in Brussels, where tomorrow NATO foreign ministers will consider ways to apply more military pressure on Serbia. Among the options being considered, airstrikes against Serbian military targets. Barry Dunsmore, ABC News, Brussels. In Cambodia, for the second time in a month, the Khmer Rouge militia has kidnapped members of the United Nations peacekeeping force, 21 of them this time, including an American. In London today, an evacuation from one of the city's busiest shopping areas, the Irish Republican Army telephoned a warning just minutes before it set off two bombs along Oxford Street, one in a department store bathroom, the other on the street. There have been more than 30 IRA attacks in London this year. Five people were injured today. When we come back, the American agenda. On the American agenda tonight is the U.S. doing enough to develop and compete in the technologies of the future. At the economic conference in Little Rock yesterday, the answer we kept hearing was no. And last night, we looked at a particularly important area of technology designed to clean up the environment. The Japanese government has been very aggressive in helping Japanese companies prepare to win an enormous market share in the future. The question is, should the U.S. government do the same thing? Once again, our agenda reporter is Ned Potter. Any materials Jim Alex says he's on to something. His company, Alameda Instruments of California, has developed a cheap way to recycle sulfuric acid used to make computer circuits. The breakthrough reduces toxic waste and saves money. This kind of environmental technology has become the world's fastest growing business. We're going to put the uh, new uh, piece yeah. here. Right now, America leads the field, and successes like Alex should be good news for the American economy. But the biggest financial backer he's found to expand his business is Japanese. We felt it was important for us to get a Japanese strategic partner rather than go on our own because that market is going to be big. Big in Japan and big worldwide, the Japanese investment in Jim Ellick is one small part of a long-term plan to lead in environmental technology. The plan is guided by the Japanese government and fully endorsed by Japan's biggest companies. In any country, companies, industries do not like too much regulation. But we are trying to utilize uh, measures so that we can make the companies want to work in the direction that we would like them to work on. So if a firm needs research help, for instance, perfecting hydrogen as a clean fuel, it can get that help from government labs. If a company needs financial help, building less polluting machinery. The government will give it tax breaks. To be sure, Japan has imposed tough regulations, but the payoff is that they often force companies to come up with environmental breakthroughs. Contrast that to the United States, 
where government regulation is often seen as government interference. There's a certain uh, arm's length concept that we have about how government and industry should interact and even a slightly adversarial uh, or concept of the relationship. Whereas in Japan, the notion is that the government is a coach uh, and it's, it's trying to help the home team. To see how the two countries differ, look at solar energy. It's an American invention often cited as an ideal power source for the next century. But for years, it was denied long-term tax breaks and other backing from the U.S. government. The result, say advocates, is that America has lost its lead to the Japanese. This is not big, bad Japan. The issue is whether we have a national will to stick with and commercialize the technology we created. Japanese firms doing solar research have been assured their government will provide backing for decades if need be. Knowing that you have the support of government allows you to proceed into projects that would be too risky otherwise. So Japanese companies say they get a tremendous boost from being part of a government plan to save the environment. And the question is how America will compete, whether Washington can make its own long-term plans and whether American companies will want to be part of them. Vice President-elect Al Gore has followed both American and Japanese environmental efforts for several years and warns we will pay a high price if U.S. business and government do not work together. If we keep on arguing among ourselves about, oh, we don't want to do this, well, <laughs> we can see very clearly that the Japanese are not going to take that approach. They're going to eat our lunch and be very happy to do it. How can the new administration prevent that? Businessmen like Jim Ellick say they need more financial backing, but more important, a clear sense of what the government is committed to for the long haul. If I can get the capital that I require and, and if I can get to an articulated industrial policy that says we really believe in the environment, uh, I think we can remain number one. The United States is still the environmental leader, but in the new global marketplace, that lead is being seriously challenged. Ned Potter, ABC News, Tokyo. On the American agenda tomorrow, a fascinating school where children pay their bills, begin their own businesses, pass laws, and just love going to class. We'll be back in just a moment. Tonight on Nightline, extraordinary images of a battle-scarred nation. The director of Field of Dreams takes us along on his personal journey through Bosnia. Finally, from us this evening, a rather unusual funeral. Unless the person who died was particularly well-known, funerals are not the stuff of the evening news. The funeral in question today, however, caught our attention because the woman who died was so utterly anonymous. ABC's Bill Greenwood reports the part of her story we do know from Petersburg, Virginia. It seemed as if there had been a death in the family. But not one of the 150 people who attended the funeral even knew the woman they came to mourn. We are gathered here today to pay respects and tribute to Wilma X. They said she didn't have a family, so we are her family. And today is an expression of how we treat our loved ones. Officials say they've never seen such a case. A frail 80-year-old woman who died suddenly of heart failure and was abandoned. The woman's body was found three weeks ago, right about there, beside a highway, wrapped in a sheet and a blanket. Police believe it was put there so it would not be hit by a passing car, but would be easily noticed. This note was found at the scene, saying her name was Wilma, with a grown stepson named Otis, that she died during a visit from North Carolina, and the people who left her body could not afford a funeral. So the town paid for it and police issued this composite picture of the woman trying to locate friends or relatives. We made all uh, possible efforts to identify her and we were not able to uh, come up with any identification. In one sense, it's very unfortunate because it's, it's unfortunate when a person doesn't have a family. But for Petersburg, it was an opportunity to come together. In the truest sense, Wilma had two families one which felt it had to abandon her, then an entire community which adopted and buried her. Bill Greenwood, ABC News, Petersburg, Virginia. And that's our report on World News Tonight. I'm Peter Jennings, Nightline Later. We'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye.
This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.